Today's seminar entitled, Accommodating Students with Psychiatric Disabilities in Colleges and Universities. This is being put on by People with Disabilities Foundation. People with Disabilities Foundation was created a little over four years ago. Our mission is to integrate people with physical and or mental impairments completely into the structure of society. Today, we are primarily interested in discussing accommodations for students with mental impairments at colleges and universities. We shall therefore also want to consider the extent to which schools are legally required to provide accommodations and what needs qualify a student for an accommodation. It is a privilege and an honor now to turn matters over to Stephen Bruce, the moderator of today's panel. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohn. Uh, Dr. Um, Cohn, um, in the uh, university setting, what are the most common disorders that you see um, with or without requests for reasonable accommodation? Sure about what are the common diagnoses that we're seeing. Um, maybe a bit of a description. I know there's some mental health professionals here, so I don't have to go into an in-depth description of these diagnoses, but I'll give little snippets of each. And more importantly than the diagnosis, um, because it's not really the diagnosis that gets the accommodations, it's the functional impact. I kind of want to talk about some broad um, adjectives that would describe the functional impact that I think are most relevant, at least in my work, to what I use to create accommodations. Um, I was very uh, scientific about this. Recently I went and pulled every chart that we have on students who have psych disabilities and decided to look at the diagnosis, look at the documentation, and try to compartmentalize things. Um, let me give you a little perspective, and I'm talking from the UC Berkeley perspective, so this could be very different at other universities, but I have a feeling, you know, as I've, I've, I've talked to some other groups of disability specialists, that when I give these numbers, I'm hearing that things are pretty similar. So on all this, there's a little error, you know, give 5% here or there, but let me throw out some numbers to you. UC Berkeley has about 30,000 students, undergraduate and graduate. Our Disabled Students Program serves about 750 of all disabilities, okay? 750 out of 30,000 students are receiving some accommodation. Um, of those 750, based on my last look, about 160 have psychiatric disabilities. Now this is not a learning disability and not ADHD. We, we have those as separate in terms of the way we look at things. So we're, uh, in terms of this, we're looking at real DSM-4 diagnoses. Um, so about 160, the majority, I think about 30 are graduate students. So the majority of these are undergraduates. Now the thing that strikes me the most when I, when I kind of put all these numbers together um, is that on any given day, I can feel like, oh my God, people are coming in left and right. I'm overwhelmed. There are too many students coming in seeking services. Well, the numbers actually are pretty small. 160 students out of 30,000 at UC Berkeley are seeking accommodations. And that's not all extended time on test. These are a variety of accommodations. So I would also kind of add on to uh, the University of Minnesota study with the idea of stigma. I think there are probably far more students walking around UC Berkeley campus who probably would qualify for services but are afraid to ask, but are, are scared to walk in. They don't want to identify themselves. Uh, I work a lot with students in terms of talking to their professors about how they can communicate their diagnosis to their professor. And, you know, we have a, a wide range. Some, some will walk in and say, I'm bipolar and this is what I need. Others kind of come in and say, hey, I have a medical condition and this is what I need. So I think that idea of stigma is really a great one because I don't think the numbers, uh, despite sometimes my experience, are all that large. Um, I definitely, and I don't have the, number, the general numbers on mental illness uh, in the community, but clearly those are pretty low. I mean, I'm not good at math, but 160 divided by 30,000 is pretty minimal. Um, Okay, so what are the most common disorders that we're seeing? About 50% of those 160 people have mood disorders. Uh, and the majority of the mood disorders are, are major depressive disorder recurrent, uh, and then the next group are bipolar. Uh, so that's really about 50% of the students that we're seeing. Um, major depressive disorder, when I say recurrent, 
I, again, I don't know the backgrounds people have. I even have a little bit of a cheat sheet here to kind of talk about it. But what we're seeing is these are people with recurrent depressive episodes. These are at least two weeks of loss of interest and pleasurable activities, um, depre depressed mood most of the day. Uh, they can have weight loss. Uh, they can have increased appetite, decreased appetite, uh, decreased sleep, increased sleep. The, you know, the, to get the diagnosis, you have a cluster of these symptoms. Uh, by all means, I don't want anyone to hear this and go, oh my God, I didn't sleep for the last couple of days. The, you know, I think it's real important that there's, it's a cluster of symptoms. And it's also um, kind of the, the next little component of it is that there's really clinical significance in occupational, academic, or social functioning, and usually more than one of these. Uh, we also will see students with, uh, with major depression uh, who have you know, feel low self-esteem and, of course, uh, suicidal ideation. So this is kind of a cluster of these for uh, major depressive disorder. And again, this usually isn't one time. It's usually not a reactive uh, you know, had problems with, with a partner, I'm missing home, things like that. These are usually really ingrained, chronic, persistent problems. Okay, so the majority major depressive disorder. Bipolar disorder is uh, what used to be called manic depression, and it's this recurrent depressive disorder with one or more uh, manic episodes, and manic episodes include uh, elevated, irritable, exp expansive mood for more than one week, um, and this is significant because I know there's a lot of talk right now about the idea that, oh, bipolar is the designer, uh, whatever, it's the designer or the uh, diagnosis of the week. Um, I think. Pardon me? It's fashionable. Fashionable. That was the word I was looking Especially for. Especially if you're a child, I think. You know, I think to really get a diagnosis of bipolar, uh, you know, when, when I saw a week of these kinds of symptoms, inflated self-esteem, grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, uh, more talkative, that was my, that's my favorite one, uh, distractibility, um, increased goal-directed behavior, and excessive involvement in pleasurable activities that lead to negative consequences. We're not talking about these things for a day. We're not talking about these things for an hour. We're talking about them for a week. It's really significant. You know, these are people who don't say, you know, I'm depressed. I'm going to go buy something. They go out and buy hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars worth of things. Uh, these are people who, I had a student once who said, you know, I just decided to paint my whole house at three in the morning and engaged in painting the entire interior of the house for, you know, over the course of 36, 48 hours. That's really what we're talking about with bipolar. And again, that, that represents about 50%. I'm trying to watch the clock because I know I only have a few minutes here. Uh, the next group, which represents, I'll say, 35 to 40% of the students uh, are the anxiety disorders. And there are three most common anxiety disorders, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, PTSD, I am seeing more and more of uh, chronic PTSD, uh, though in terms of the numbers that I looked at at our university, it was still pretty low. Um, generalized anxiety is uh, excessive anxiety or worry for more days than not over a course of six months. Again, this isn't just... Uh, you know, worrying about your bills for a week or two when, when things get tight. This is over the course of six months. This is real chronic persistent problems. Uh, difficulty controlling the worry. And, uh, you know, with this there can be restlessness, easily fatigued, uh, physical symptoms, distractibility, concentration problems. Uh, again, so you see it's more chronic. Panic disorder are recurrent, unexpected panic attacks. I think we all know in our minds what a panic attack is. Uh, you know, the, fe the, the feeling of sweat, the heart pounding, the stomach ache, the feeling like you're going to pass out. Um, the key component on this one that, that really, again, strikes me to take it away from the normal things that I think anyone in here may have experienced at one point in their life is the idea of recurrent and unexpected. So these aren't things that we know are going to happen. Uh, it's not something that, you know, I know if I get up in front of people, I am going to have a panic attack. These are unexpected things that come about. Uh, they tend to lead to persistent concern about having the attacks. Um, persistent worry about the implications and avoidance behavior. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder are the recurrent. I hope I'm not doing this too quickly, but I really kind of wanted to, to move through. I, I know there are lots, going, of, lots uh, of questions. Um, recurrent persistent thoughts, impulses, or images. Um, they're much greater than 
excessive worry, they're, they're much more than excessive worry. Um, the person tries to uh, suppress them and in fact the person knows, this is one of the benchmarks of OCD with the obsessive thoughts, is the person knows they shouldn't have these thoughts. Uh, you know, so, uh, and then of course the compulsions are the behaviors oftentimes associated with those thoughts. So if I wash my hands, 15 times, 100 times before I leave the house, those germs will go away. Um, so that's, we're now at about 85, 90% and the kind of the last 8 to 10%, you know, I, again, don't want to put too much on the, the percentage, are the psychotic disorders and the most, uh, the, the diagnosis that most fits within that is, is schizophrenia. Uh, and. Uh, there we see students who have at least one month of hallucinations or delusions. Uh, delusion, delusions are the false beliefs. The neighbor is sending signals into my house. Um, hallucinations, which can be auditory, all fact, auditory, you're hearing it. The most common there are hearing voices, uh, olfactory, scent, or visual. Um, but the most common is usually hearing voices. And we see those, they'll have those symptoms for a month and then they'll be, uh, Again, clinically significant um, deterioration in social, occupational, academic functioning for at least six months to actually get that particular diagnosis. Um, so those are the most common disorders that we're seeing. Some other things, we have a couple students who are being served for eating disorders. We do have students who are being served for substance abuse disorders, but we do have you know, the caveat that they're in treatment. Uh, we cannot, when a student comes in and says, I need services for major depressive disorder, we cannot mandate treatment at, at all. Um, I encourage students to get treatment. Uh, I talk that the ability to keep your accommodations going may be dependent on continuing to have good documentation. So that's a way that I'm able to encourage students to be in treatment. But we can't mandate treatment except for with substance use. When there's substance use, we can mandate that this person, and we need documentation that the person is in treatment. Okay. Now, again, here we have a diagnosis, and here we have these cluster of symptoms associated with the diagnosis. And that's great to, as you say, kind of make, yeah, you have a disability. What is most important to us as service providers is to figure out what's the most reasonable accommodation. And I have, I've kind of have a list of, uh, area, uh, kind of descriptors in terms of functional impact that I think regardless of the disorder, regardless of the, uh, the diagnosis that, that I kind of look for when I'm, when I'm looking at documentation. And I wish I had a slide I could put up, I do not. Um, but these are the areas. Uh, concentration, regardless, whether you're depressed, whether you have OCD, whether you have schizophrenia, there may be concentration problems. Now they may be different, you know, so if someone who's depressed, it's part of the, it's part of the diagnosis that there can be concentration problems, whereas someone who's schizophrenic may have concentration problems because of the voices or because of the medication. Uh, we don't have a, a psychiatrist on, uh, on the panel, um, but I would like to speak a, as well about, you know, some of the medications that, that students have to take for these illnesses especially the bipolar and uh, medications for the psychotic disorders, uh, I can't explain to you, uh, I have not taken them, but I can't explain to you the effect I've seen on my students. Uh, and the student really is faced with a choice. Do I live with some of these symptoms or do I live with the side effects of the medication? And I don't think it's a great choice all the time. Um, and so concentration is a big one that that, that can get involved in. Uh, memory is another one. How is all this impacting your memory? Uh, sleeping, eating we look at, social interaction is another large one. Um, that's one where I, you know, we have classes that have six, seven hundred people and sometimes putting a, you know, I don't want to take your fire away from you, but putting someone in a separate room to take an exam so they can just be out of that large 600 person room is really important. Self-care. Um, Another one that really is interesting across the board, managing internal and external distractions. And again, for someone who has OCD, where they can't answer the question because they need to ruminate about that over and over, you know, that's something I want to know about. That's something to think about. Uh, timely submission of assignments, attendance of class regularly, making and keeping appointments are all, again, something I want to know about. It, 
whether we can put something in terms of an accommodation is another story, but it's something that impacts them, and it impacts, again, whether it's depression, OCD, schizophrenia, it affects these students. And finally, um, stress management and organization. Uh, I think that, that that's a, that's a, it's a huge area that I want some information about from the treating professional um, so that I can help the student f and figure out some management techniques and some reasonable accommodations. Um, there are two things that I really like to do with my students and what I say to them when I introduce myself is I say that I have two roles as a disability specialist. Um, my main role is the university's paying me to make sure that, that we don't discriminate against you. We want to make sure that you have equal access to your educational opportunity. But I'm not a lawyer. Um, it's not really why I got into the business. The second component of what I do <coughs> is to try to help you manage and to help you figure out ways and to support you and to help you graduate. Um, you know, to keep you in this university and to help you graduate. And so that's the place that I really enjoy. Um, though we do have to deal with the, the legal issues, obviously, first. Um, is there a grievance procedure um, in terms of s someone's disabled, um, but, but the problem is the university doesn't want to provide the uh, accommodation? Uh, I'm not going to so say. So, what, what should a reason. student do if they don't? If a, the university yeah. refuses to give an accommodation? Is there any? Is there? Can they go somewhere at, at UC uh, Berkeley and, and ask um, for some kind of a, a due process, fair hearing, or something to that effect? Sure. You know, we have on our, I hate to do one of these things, we're on our website, we have our grievance procedure, and we point every student to our grievance website. If I can ask a, a question in the nature of a hypothetical, suppose you have a student who's diagnosed as a psychotic, uh, usually schizo with schizophrenic, but sometimes not otherwise specified, with major depression and agoraphobia and with uh, panic attacks. And it's further assumed that uh, this individual decompensates into what we would call a major psychotic episode only five to six times a year, but it really lasts at least two weeks, and, and often he would be hospitalized, um, but only, only that often. But also assume he's extremely bright, and, and there's no question that, and the program is either, um, uh, he wants to be either a registered uh, nurse or, or a lawyer or some professional uh, uh, program with, with a lot of technical requirements. Um, what, how would you advise uh, someone who, who has a lot of functional limitations, an agoric the meaning not even wanting to leave the house to go to class and being in the hospital need, would need it incomplete, I would assume, on a lot of courses. Um, let's assume it, it's at the end of the semester, so it's all those courses. I'm going to stop there. I, mean, I can go on and on, but I just want to, just want to uh, give a sort of an extreme example of someone who's brilliant. Uh, we'll just say very smart. Obviously, can sure can do the. Um, and they have every disorder that I listed. Um, okay. Um, well, you know what? I, there are a couple. One of the things that I say to all my students when I meet with them is that, that, that DSP, DSS, um, the Disabled Students Program, we're, and accommodations, it's a proactive institution. We don't do well reactively. We're not a crisis center. So the, 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 the greatest thing for a student is to be to get the most appropriate accommodations out there and also help prepare them for the difficult times. So the first thing I would do is is this is kind of like talking about stress management. And people say, well, what do I do when I'm stressed? Well, the thing I tell them to do is figure out ways not to get stressed. You know, it's trying to pull yourself out of it is the hard part. It's much easier if you plan ahead. I do that too when I talk about test anxiety. But so when I meet with a student who has any of these disorders, one of the things that I wholeheartedly advocate for is a reduced course load. And I do it for two reasons. And usually when I talk to the student, they really, they, they, they bite onto this because it's true is that one, we know you have chronic persistent problems. That's why you have the diagnosis and that's why we're going to be able to kind of create this accommodation. So we know there may be a point in the semester where things go bad. The one thing is we know that if we can reduce you down from let's say 16 units to to eight units, nine units, ten units, two or three courses as opposed to four or five, your stress level is going to go down. It's automatic. And that may, in fact, help that, that cycle and keep you from going so far down when things get bad. 
Um, the second reason the reduced course load is good is that if you're in two classes and you have a major episode and you have to go to the hospital or you don't have to go to the hospital and you find that you're spending a week and a half at home, it's far easier to climb out of two classes than it is four. And so I find that when my students are on a reduced course load, they don't have to withdraw as often. They don't have to take incompletes uh, as often. Now there are cases where at the end of the semester a student misses the final paper, the, the final exam, you know, and, and what we can do is try to work with the faculty to take an incomplete or to get, to work with the college to get a withdraw so that they can get that off their transcript, take it again. Um, you know, these are, in, these are issues that, that I, I can let the lawyer deal with in terms of when does that become a management issue uh, in terms of how the student's dealing with it versus an accommodation issue. Uh, the students at, 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 at any university have to fulfill the fundamental obligations of the courses there. And if they can't do that, then, um, you know, we can't override that. For example, I had a student who was in a field study class and she missed two weeks in the hospital. Um, I, I communicated with the professor and the professor said, you know what, she missed so much field work, there's absolutely no way she can meet the requirements of this course. And so she had, and what I did is I worked with the college to help her withdraw from the course. She took it again the following semester, whatever. Um, so there are going to be points where we can't trump the basic fundamental aspect of the course. So is, does that uh, Thank you very much. Uh, that is helpful. But I, before the break, I want to bring Nicole uh, Bond into this uh, discussion um, because you deal with the population of students, some of which are psychiatrically impaired. impaired and I want you to assume really the, the basically the same uh, hy hypothetical um, question, but assume that this this individual, uh, let's say his name is Joe, has a therapist who he's working with uh, every week and a psychiatrist who's prescribing whatever medications are indicated. And uh, let me just add that because I don't want to make it any more complicated than it is. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Is there anything different or that you would add in terms of how you, what you would suggest um, uh, for the student to be there or, or is this a situation where you might suggest the student um, should not be in the program? Well, that's a good question. I think um, one of the things that's really important as the student is making choices in, in terms of the kind of course load, keeping with that train, that they're going to make is, is this something, they, they need to be making choices that are going to realistically get them to wherever their end goal is. And in my experience, most students don't want to take a reduced course load, especially if their diagnosis has just been made. So part of the responsibility that we can undertake in the disability services side is trying to help the student understand kind of what the, the pros are to uh, taking a reduced course load as one example. Another thing that the disability services office can continue to do then is help the student learn how to talk about their disability with faculty members and with other deans in the event that it does get to a point where they need to withdraw or they need to approach their faculty with their accommodations, that kind of thing. So I think the, the biggest thing that I tell students as they come in for the first time is that this is your responsibility to work with the Disability Services Office. So one thing that we, we can't do as an example is if a student is on a type of medication that makes them maybe really drowsy or oversleep, the disability services cannot call the student up and tell them to come to their exam, which is one of which is something that happens. So part of the part of our responsibility is teaching the student about the disability and using these. Uh, the referral services that they have in terms of their uh, therapeutic treatment, uh, uh, and so they continue to use them and then can continue to be successful. So if Joe, you know, missed a lot of days because he had a couple of episodes and and really got a lot of incompletes, and the program was only designed to be two years, let's say it was a for a registered nurse or for an, 
to MSW where someone wanted to be a licensed clinical social worker. And we're now really getting uh, past four years into five years. Um, what is it just, do we just plot along this sort of the same and, and try to, you know, make it work? Or? Well, everything needs to be considered on a case by case basis. So the first responsibility, I think, is to look at the nature of the curriculum that the student is trying to complete. And what is it about the curriculum that makes it so that a student might need to complete uh, a a certain degree program in a certain amount of time. For example, there are some uh, licensing programs and curriculums that require that you get through the program in a set amount of time because the codes and standards and things change. So that is something that we need to look at. But in order to make that determination, we really need to look at what is it about the specific program that would need to be considered as an alteration or an accommodation. So I wouldn't across the board, if someone has a specific psychiatric di diagnosis say, you can't take, you shouldn't take this kind of track because it's not suited for someone with your condition. We wouldn't do that. We'd look very specifically at the nature of the program and see what it is and what is the fundamental requirements of that program and can you satisfy them with some reasonable accommodations. I think we're going to take a break soon, but I want to ask Paul Grossman in the same vein to st take this a step further. Do you ever get plain, let's say it's the same hypothetical, it's with all these uh, functional limitations, um, and he ends up uh, saying he's consulted with disability services for the last four years, and he says uh, that they're steering him out of the program, and it's not fair uh, because, and it's obvious he's competent to do it, but uh, as uh, Nicole said, there are, the, the rules may change over the year if you want to be a, a clinical uh, professional and we can't let you go for six years, so why don't you be something else like uh, an LVN or something? Let's unbundle this from the student's point of view and from the college's point of view for a second. The student needs to understand that there are what are called essential program requirements, word you used and a word you used. And the student must, with reasonable accommodation, meet those essential program requirements. If with reasonable accommodation they can still not meet the essential program requirements, they are not qualified and they are not protected by the ADA or Section 504. Now, of course, one person's essential program may be somebody else's ephemeral program requirement, and that's why you have lawyers, so we can make money off that kind of dispute. <laughs> uh, but um, it, it's very important, and you need to know that the courts give colleges and universities a lot of deference in them deciding for themselves what is an essential program requirement. So let's take the attendance rules. Okay. Let's say that, that to be in this nursing program, you, have, you can only miss four classes in a semester because it's a very concentrated course. And due to this person's disability, they missed six classes. Okay. All right. Excuse me. If I was representing the student, well, let me take it the other way. What the school's going to say is we have a rule. This rule applies to everybody. It's unfair to make an exception to the rule. We didn't discriminate against the student. We just applied to them the same rule as everyone else. That totally misses the point of the law. Totally. Why? Because the point of the law is that you have to look at that rule and decide, can it be accommodated? Let's go back to the basic case. I don't know if you all remember the case of P.J. versus Martin, the golfer that wanted to use the golf cart because one of his legs was missing. And um, the PGA, the Professional Golfers Association said, this is a competitive sport. Nobody gets to use a golf cart. It's a rule that's existed since St. Andrews. Um, he doesn't get the cart. And the Supreme Court threw the book at the PGA and said, no, you must make an individualized determination. The fact that it's a rule does not end the consideration. So when a college or university says to me, hey, Paul, forget it. Here's the rule. It can't be discriminatory because it's a rule. Baloney. OK, but now we got to look at it the other way, which is OK. But what does it do 
to the continuity of that course to permit a student to miss six classes. And you may well look at the content of the course and how much instruction would be lost if you miss six classes and say, you know what? It's a fundamental alteration to that course to permit somebody to miss six classes. Attending, attending all but four classes is essential. And sorry, it may be entirely because of your disability. You may be brilliant, as you said in your hypothetical. The student may be knocking themselves out to get to class, but if you miss six classes, it's two classes too many, you're not qualified, and you're out of here. Wouldn't that be unreasonable if they just said, well, they'll just take them the next semester? I mean, uh, it lets, uh, I mean, that's a program rule. We want you to take them you know, within that period okay. of time. But if the student says, Stephen, I the, understand the, the that. The same analysis applies. Let's say the, the rule is you must get through here in no more than three years. Right. If you just stop at the rule, you have not followed the mandate of the law. But now if you look behind the rule and say, why is the rule three years? Well, because after a certain amount of time, you're not learning the same skills as we started with. The, the content, to, to use some medical school cases, the continuity of the curriculum has been destroyed. Okay? The, 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 now, when we graduate you, we need you to know things that are not the things that were in your first semester. Again, at some point, the continuity becomes so great that you've gone beyond what is fundamental to the course, you've made a fundamental alteration, and you're outside the limit. Now, that might be four years or five years instead of three, but it can't be 10. And I have graduate PhD cases where students want 13 years, right? And the English department says, you know what? We don't even have one single instructor that was here when the student started this course, and we don't agree with anything that was taught back then, and no, we're not going to give you 13 years. It, we have a question. I just wanted to um, bring out the, the, the whole issue that there's life after school, too. And after school, there are certifying examinations which need to be taken. There are job applications uh, which need to be taken. I don't think there may be cases where you're not doing anybody a favor by letting him or her do get the degree if they're not never going to be able to get a job um, or never be able to pass the state boards or whatever. Well, let me, let me answer the legal side of that point that you're making. Anything that is absolutely, literally, specifically required by a state licensing requirement is an essential requirement. So if, for example, the state says as to get a teaching certificate you must practice teaching three semesters. There cannot be any exception to that. And that is an essential requirement and the school can enforce it, okay? Even if it's unreasonable? Like even, if, even if it is un, unreasonable. Schools are entitled to comply with state licensing exams. What you can't do is say, well, because you have to have the skill on licensing exam, we think it would be good if you did this or that. It, you know, it has to be a little specific licensing requirement. Now let me give the philosophical side to this, which I think often gets overlooked, and frankly for people with psychiatric disabilities, at least serious psychiatric disabilities, is very important. My brother started law school in the terminal stages of cancer. Indeed, he died three days after he passed the New Jersey bar. He never had a single client in his life. And from the point of view of the state of New Jersey where he got his education and took the bar, he probably wasn't a very good investment in terms of turning out a lawyer. But if you asked him why, because I certainly wouldn't do this, you know, why in the world did you decide to go to law school knowing you were dying of cancer? His answer was right on. His answer was, look, as the cancer progresses, I lost my ability to eat. I lost my ability to mobilize. I lost my ability to have sex. But every day of my life, I still got to think. I still got to analyze. I still got to argue. And that is what made me feel up till the very last days of my life, I was alive and it was worth being alive. And I think that if we only think that the purpose of education is to produce people to work, we are missing a very important point 
of education, for t particularly for people with severe disabilities. And I, I really think it is wrong-headed thinking to only look at the job market. Now, let me give you one other example of a, of a different way to look at this. The, most, the first Supreme Court case on people with disabilities concerned a deaf woman who wanted to become a nurse. And the Supreme Court upheld the right of the college to refuse to admit the deaf woman because there was no way that she could do the surgical nursing portion of the program. It just, they, they thought about it, there was no way to work it out. So the, the court upheld the school's right to say, you're not qualified for this program. And as a legal matter, they were right. However, if you go to Fremont, to the school for the deaf, I guarantee you they'll pay you about 20,000 bucks if you could find them a signing nurse. Right? And we forget that people with disabilities need to serve the disabled community. And that when we set those kind of limitations and restrictions, we're screwing ourselves. Now, I can think of my example. I got a BA degree in political science from UC Santa Barbara in 1980, and I was within uh, three years after graduation, I was on SSI. I had been declared unemployable. I use that to serve, uh, I work with the California Network of Mental Health Plans, and I've used my background on particularly learning how to research political issues as well as other causes to help explain why I agree or disagree for another movement. I'm going to be, well, I was at the GTU till I was struck with a kidney stone a couple of days ago and thrown in bed. bed but but it made you an advocate. I mean, I, but I don't get paid as an advocate. I work, I get, I send stuff to the public policy committee. I, I oftentimes uh, look at, at potential allies and so on. And, Learning how to research uh, political movements. Uh, the other thing was uh, I started taking classes for therapeutic purposes. I want to I want to want to enter a career in create in creative writing. The position at the Department of Rehab is that this is well. If I apply for a student loan and this, the state government is not going to say. Uh, Sorry, we won't give you a loan if you're an English literature major because there's too many. Uh, because you're not going to get a job because of that, that they'll give you the loan straight out if you can pay it back. But we have said, well, you want to write because you think that it may help you deal with some of what you've been through in your life, but that's not going to be a paying job, and we shouldn't, why should we send you to pay for you to go to college to get, I, and all I was asking for was just to get BART and books reimbursed for a, uh, literature classes so I could learn writing styles and the fact that literature classes were potentially therapeutic. I, I don't want us to digress here too much, but I think your point is very well taken. And the funny thing for me is when we were at, at AHEAD, uh, it was a conference that both of us just went to, there was an individual who uh, is schizophrenic and talked about how in an organic way schizophrenia was essential to being a great writer. Well, Richard Shader, a great Palmer, wrote published writing from a guy from a mental hospital. So, and he so, got fired as editor of a meeting story so I, after the fact because people objected to quote unquote delusional writings showing up in his magazine. Ray Palmer took a risk and he lost his. Uh, again, I don't, I don't want to digress too much, and we need to go on our break. So I'm sorry, I'm, I want to, I'm going to have to cut you off. But I think you give an example of one more reason why we can't always think about employment as the only goal for education.